Κυρίες και κύριοι, καλώ. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us today in this beautiful venue. This is symbolical, a symbolical place, and it will be part of our discussion later, i.e. the Kipseli Municipal Market in an area in the heart of Athens, in an area with its own history, and in an area which in the last uh, few years uh, is continuing uh, to make uh, history. It's a vibrant uh, uh, neighborhood. We have people from the area with us, uh, residents, that is, and I think dialogues, the dialogues today will be a true dialogue, uh, not only amongst our guest speakers, but also with you, the public, the people who are here with us today, those of you who've come from Africa, those of you originating from Africa, those of us who know the people who have African descent, and we are inspired by you. And I'd like to say that uh, we also uh, have the other side of the same coin. So I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. These are the dialogues. It's a monthly event. Uh, it's in a different place, uh, but uh, once a month. Uh, and uh, the purpose of this initiative of SNF Dialogues is to open up a discussion on matters that are of importance to us all. And we have uh, speakers uh, who actually know more about the subject uh, and uh, who are more experts uh, regarding the different aspects of these dialogues. So we can listen to them. We can ask questions. We can disagree with one another. This is something that I repeat uh, all the time and my colleagues as well. And I'd like to thank you for responding to our invitation and for being here. It's a great honor for us and a great joy because the real meaning of dialogues is for us to remember what it's like to talk to one another, what it's like to listen to the person sitting next to us, and not to be afraid of disagreeing with one another, and not to marginalize those who disagree with us and with our own views. And I think the ultimate objective is uh, to have more questions questions and not to offer answers. And I think that every answer is subjective. It's open to further investigation. And this is the only way in order for us to move on, to move further. So come with us. Uh, let us enter into this dialogue about Africa and about the African community in Greece and how it uh, is actually functioning, in particular in Athens, more so in Kipseli, but not only in the area of Kipseli. And let let us also see where Africa is on the world map and where Greece is vis-a-vis uh, -vis Africa. And Mr. Jularas will be talking to us later, and I'm sure that we should actually know more about Africa, about this great continent. It's a continent with many colors. It has a long-standing history as well, and it has many different speeds and many needs simultaneously. And there is a great interest in Africa, particularly in relation to the economy of Africa, and I know that Africa has many financial problems facing most of the peoples living on the African continent. I will actually borrow a phrase that you mentioned to me. We, Greece, are closer to Africa than other European countries are to Africa. However, we know very little about Africa, maybe nothing about its history and other things related to Africa. So I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. Let me introduce our speakers, uh, the people who are with us today. After welcoming all of you who are also watching to uh, us through live streaming, SNF.org, you will be with us in this discussion, in this dialogue, and we want you to be attentive. We want to get comments from you. We are waiting for your questions. We want you to actively be involved, snf.org uh, slash questions, so that your questions uh, may uh, be part of our dialogue. Nikos Dubida is uh, next to me. Thank you, Mr. Dubidan, uh, be, for being with us. He's the managing director of Generation 2.0. And here we will see what's happening with the second generation, uh, how they are actually uh, doing things uh, and what you see all these years and how things have changed, knowing from your own personal history and your own family. And I'm sure that you now are a Greek citizen and you've been monitoring a lot of things happening in Greece and 
and particularly in Athens. So we see that in Athens, uh, there's a vibrant African community, so it's uh, more lively than in other cities. We also have Manelios Karamagiolis, a film director, producer, writer. He's also a script writer. It's very uh, nice to have you with us, Mr. Karamagiolis. Uh, and we'll actually look at a survey conducted regarding the African community. You are a resident of Kipseli, and uh, we want uh, into the discussion to have the view of somebody living in uh, this area and not just uh, people from outside. So in order for us to be able to see where the meeting point can be for all of us, whether we are residents, whether we are experts or professionals, as I said, meaning that we have a different way of seeing things, we are observers, so we are onlookers and observers. And this is important because we'd like to take a note of everything in relation to this matter. We also have Mr. Sotiris Musuris. He's the chairman of the Hellenic African Chamber of Commerce and Development. Thank you very much, Mr. Musuris, for being with us. Let's see what initiatives have been undertaken by the Hellenic African Chamber. Let's see if any activities from Greece are now taking root in Africa. Let's see if there is an interest uh, from the Greek side as to what's happening in Africa, but also as to what's happening in the African communities here in Greece. One of the questions is whether all of you, apart from today's uh, event, actually get to work together and you get to meet one another and collaborate. Loretta McCauley is with us. Thank you very much, Mrs. McCauley, for being here. Let's see what's happening in relation to women. Women have a particular place a particular position, maybe not the rightful place uh, in Africa, but uh, women have a particular place, uh, a particular role here in Greece uh, as well. So you are the founder, Mrs. McCauley, of United African Women Organization, and you'll tell us uh, the position of the African woman in Greek society and everything that you have been monitoring through your own work. And it would be very interesting to see uh, what uh, developments have taken place, Mr. Kuvaras. Uh, you're from Action Aid. I know you carry out many missions in Africa. You go to various African countries. And it would also be very interesting to see if things have improved, if you've seen any improvements. And uh, of course, uh, I think uh, that regardless of age, uh, we always remember missions, humanitarian aid being sent to Africa. So all these needs and anything uh, that uh, has to um, do with Africa. Has this changed the policies of other countries vis-a-vis -vis Africa? Have there been any improvements in Africa itself? So has there been a change, a positive change? Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Juliaras, you know a lot about this matter. You can tell us about the different speeds in Africa. And I know you're very active as a scientist, and you've also written books about Africa, the global interest in the African continent continent, but also what's happening in uh, North and South uh, Africa. We have this big, uh, if you like, uh, gap or distinction. And then we have the differences among other African countries as well. Mr. Juliaras is Professor of Comparative Politics and International Relations at the University of Peloponnese. So let me say, and I don't know if you've tried it, but it's worth trying it. And I think I saw most of you holding a little cup of coffee because uh, outside uh, or just at the entrance, uh, we were able to take a sip of Ethiopian coffee, and it was prepared in the traditional way and also served in the traditional way. This is a ritual. It's a culture. It's a multi-layered culture coming from Africa. So I think it's good for us to look at it, uh, to taste it, uh, and to enjoy it. And uh, then we have a lot of other surprises in store for you, because Africa is a culture all its own. It's not just the problems beleaguering Africa. And we also have uh, the religious aspect. And here we have some very good examples, particularly in relation to the West. We have a different stance altogether, a different life philosophy, a different way of perceiving things that happen in our lives, but also in afterwards when people die. So the first question that I'd like to ask each of you has to do with why you responded to our invitation. Why did you come to take part in this dialogue? And the first thing uh, 
that I like to ask is, and just speak spontaneously, and please be brief and succinct, what comes to mind when you hear the word Africa? So that's my first question. So good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to say, I'd like to tell you what Africa means to me. Nigeria, because Nigeria is the country I come from, and Africa is what I lived uh, up until a young uh, age, uh, and even when I became older. But I've never actually been to Africa. I have a feeling of Africa, but Africa was in my house. Uh, we live far from Africa, but we have Africa with us. We carry it with us. So uh, we had it inside our house because I grew up with the principles and the values of the African people, meaning from the uh, country uh, of my parents, and uh, that is uh, Nigeria. So even though I only went to Nigeria for the first time a year ago, I felt very familiar with Nigeria. And how did you feel when you set foot in Nigeria? Because it's quite impressive that you've lived here all your life, you were born here, you grew up here, and it will be very interesting to tell us more about Generation 2.0 oh, and what exactly you've been doing all these years. But how did you feel when you actually went and landed in Africa a year ago? As strange as it may seem, as soon as the plane landed, well, let me say that uh, when you are approaching for landing and when you're going past all these countries, these African countries and everything I could see before actually landing, I was in awe. I uh, felt awe uh, in relation to Africa, but I felt that Africa is a magical country when I landed, but it didn't seem surreal or unreal. For example, I spoke, I, I spoke three languages while growing up, and uh, I spoke the Nigerian dialect, uh, Yoruba, and uh, I never felt that I was in a strange land or a foreign land. Why? Because I knew the language, I felt very confident when speaking it, I knew the traditions, the customs, the culture, and whereas all this was very familiar, the way that the locals treated me was very different. And maybe this is what's so remarkable, meaning when I went there, I was the stranger. I was like a white. But at the same time, I felt as if I was at home, right smack in the center of Athens in Keramikos. Mr. Karamagioli, what is Africa? What is Africa for you? What feelings does it evoke? Uh, what emotions? And let me say that you also live in Kipseli. Well, I'm not here to speak so much. I'm here to listen and to show. I live in Gipsali since I was a young lad. I'm in the corner over there. I know the uh, neighborhood very well. I've actually seen all its transformations from up close. I've seen how uh, people abandoned it and they went to the suburbs. Most of them seeking a different type of life. And um, how we actually deserted this uh, area and how we've welcomed the new uh, residents. And the uh, main reason that I'm here is uh, that uh, we have these people who are in the audience amongst us, these people who were uh, in the film. Africa is something that uh, brings to mind either tourism or colonialism or uh, slavery that continues with various uh, fashions and manners throughout the um, whole of our planet. But uh, what I want to say here is that uh, people have been asking me for years, why do you actually live here? They all consider this neighborhood to be a ghetto. We see that uh, most people don't come for decades. And uh, they actually pointed the finger in the young colored uh, people of this area. But I must say that I personally am very uh, grateful to them because they've renewed uh, my interest for the uh, area because uh, I went through a crisis when it came, came to Athens and Gipseli, but they've always been my guide. 
whenever I um, want to moan and groan about what's happened recently in uh, Greece. So these people have uh, been wrongly connected with uh, criminality because uh, only a very small uh, amount or a small number of them actually perpetrate such and we see that most people have been born here, but they don't have papers. And these people insist and persist. And uh, what they do manage mostly are success stories. So the main reason that I wanted to be here is to actually uh, rid this area of uh, any guilt or any um, ill views of this uh, community. What about you, Ms. Mushuri? Well, 50 years ago, I went from Africa to New York. I was an economist for the UN, and uh, I had spent one year in Africa, in 11 countries of West Africa. And there we tried to create, uh, in fact, a single market in West Africa, and we failed there. And uh, the UN has, in fact, failed in many uh, points, unfortunately. And I went to Africa on quite a few other occasions even as a representative of the Greek government. And I visited 15 countries then. I fell in love with Africa when I first set foot on it. And uh, I must say that I have uh, been actually uh, uh, been involved with Africa throughout the course of my career in the UN. And when I came back to Greece, I felt it was crazy that uh, Greeks who are 200 miles away from Africa not to know it, not to be involved with it, to be uh, for Africa to be their um, incognita. And um, that is why uh, we uh, created um, the uh, Hellenic African Chamber of Commerce and Development with Friends to convince the uh, Greek entrepreneurs to uh, look southwards. At that time, they uh, were interested to, to go northwards towards the Balkans. We have 180 members. We have a lot of people who are important and who are on the board. I have two uh, members here amongst the audience. And uh, I think that we're doing our utmost in order to uh, convince people. We lobby in favor of Africa so that people know about its prospects and outlook. And I think it's amazing. It's a huge uh, and vast continent. It uh, has uh, the same territory as uh, the um, US uh, um, as Europe and uh, China. And uh, we see that one in three uh, who are going to be born in some year's time will be African. And uh, it has 1,550,000,000 uh, uh, inhabitants. It has people that are resilient and inventive. And we must say that it's women who are the uh, main capital of Africa. And we have a woman. Uh, from Africa next to me, and we understand what it means. It's the African women that keep uh, Africa on its feet, and I think it's the Africans hope. Okay, yeah, Mrs. McCauley, we're all ears. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us uh, here. For me, Africa is my home. Africa's my continent. I consider that uh, Africa is, uh, in fact, a wealthy continent. And uh, we have many things that can't be found elsewhere. But there is one problem in Africa, and that is exploitation. They have actually made us to actually beg elsewhere. We're beggars. So uh, I think that there's no... Uh, uh, journal on charity that does not actually uh, show a picture of uh, a child from Africa. And it's exploitation that makes us leave Africa. And when we leave, we still have impediments in this uh, um, choice of ours. Wherever we go, we have, uh, in fact, problems that are related to our color. They say that we're third world people. I don't know what God told them that, but I must say that uh, Africa is a continent and it has a great diversity of things and people. And we say in Africa, in order for a child to actually grow up, they need the whole village. So that's why I'm saying that uh, Africa is a continent and you cannot find it elsewhere. Uh, but uh, I think that would be the case if there was no exploitation. We'll come back to this, however.
πολύ δύσκολο να πει. It's very difficult uh, to uh, put Africa in a phrase. It's the past and the future. I uh, was thinking how I feel, how I feel when I'm in Africa, because I've been working for Action Aid and I've traveled under this capacity to many African countries. And you feel a combination of guilt and hope. The guilt because of white colonialism, not of the past, but also of the present, the new colonialism, and the hope, the hope for what is being done through uh, Action Aid, but also through the community that I have visited, this transformation of life, meaning helping people change their lives and grasp their lives with both their hands. And it's awe. I'm in awe of women, and I admire them immensely, the strength of the women. And then you can feel that the whole world can change thanks to these strong women. Mr. Juliaras, you have the floor. I remember that my father liked paleontology. My father had paleontology as a hobby. Can you hear me? Is the microphone on? Yes, could you please speak closer to the microphone? When I was a little kid, my father liked paleontology, and he showed me Africa on the map. And he would say to me, should I repeat it? Should I repeat what I just said? So I repeat it. I remember when I was a child, my father, who liked paleontology, used to show me the map of Africa. And he said, it all started here. Homo sapiens, the uh, modern man, uh, first appeared in Africa. Africa is our country. It's the country of all of us. It's our homeland. And when I traveled to Africa, I feel how much interest we must show to this continent. There is a, a Marxist a British a female professor, Joan Robinson, who said that there's something that's worse than exploitation, and that's apathy, meaning if nobody wants to exploit you, that's even worse than exploitation, indifference. So I think we need to turn our attention and to focus our attention on Africa. And everybody here tries in their own way to turn the attention of uh, Greece that is somewhat introverted. We want them to look towards the towards Africa, which is on the other side, if you like, this great continent. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. At this point, I'd like us to all watch a video, a video for which there was a survey, but uh, this is uh, something important. We know that this person has established relations, has got to know many people, and I think uh, that this video will show us many activities, but also concerns and problems facing the African community in Athens. Menelios Karamagiolis will present the video to us. So without further ado, I want us to watch this video very carefully, to listen to all the people speaking, in this video and to understand and feel what's happening because there are a lot of emotional moments and uh, you have this uh, alternation of feelings and emotions and uh, then based on what we hear in the video and what these participants tell Mr. Karamangiolis, we can have a discussion on that. Thank you very much. I think we should stand in order for the people to have a good view, because otherwise we'll be in the way. Thank you. Hey, 
mtoto wangu ile Astina Afrika mimi akiria le siko agapi mpoini poi poi tan yana siko tio andratis na sipnisi pedemu tokpo maoleo tokpo loni gualindia tokpo maoleo e yo pai Αλληλεία. Τεχνική ιστορία θα πω για μια πριγκιπέσα που εκπροσωπούσε το χορό, το ρυθμό και τον πλούτο. Το βασίλειο τη ξακουστώ γιατί ήταν άγρια όμορφο. Αφρικά το όνομά τη, η ματιά τη ήταν γιορτή. Πίσω από την πλάτη τη αυτή κάναν συνοικέσια. Πήραν τα λεφτά και πουλήσανε την Αφρικά φτηνά. Και αυτή έγινε πόρνια διφάγων τεράτων που τη ρουφούσαν σαν κυφίνε. Αφρικά. We talking about the motherland, Africa. 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 Τόσο πλούσια. Ήπειρος, πώς έφτασα το σημείο. Με την απεικιοκρατία, με την κακή διαχείριση, με την προδοσία, με τη σκλαβιά. Στην Κάνα, αλλά είμαι γεννημένο εδώ στην Ελλάδα. Νιγηρία, συγκεκριμένα από το Λέγκο. From Sierra Leone. I came to Greece so many years ago, 1996. Εγώ δεν είμαι από Νιγηρία, αλλά γεννήθηκα εδώ. Εφιόπα είμαι. Έχω καταγωγή από την Νιγηρία και είμαι Ελληνίδα. Αλλά μου αρέσει να αποκαλούμε Αφροελληνίδα. I came from Nigeria. Είμαι από την Νότια Αφρική, Γιωάννης Μπέκ. Είμαι 17 χρονών, είμαι από την Κάνα και εδώ στην Κυψέλη. Yeah, I love Κυψέλη, like, it's a home for me. Εγώ όλα μόνο καλέ μου. Βλέπω, βλέπω. Βλέπω, βλέπω. Βλέπω, βλέπω. Βλέπω, βλέπω. Βλέπω, βλέπω. Βλέπω, βλέπω. Εδώ έχω μεγαλώσει. Εδώ έχω πολλά παιδιά τα οποία έχουμε μεγαλώσει μαζί, πάλι Αφροέλληνες. Ούτε Αφρικάνος μπορώ να πω ότι είμαι, ούτε όμως Έλληνας μπορώ να πω ότι είμαι. Είμαι και τα δύο. Άρα είμαστε Αφροέλληνες. Αφροέλληνες. Το πει ότι έχω ρίζες από την Αφρική, αλλά είμαι γεννημένος εδώ. Είμαι Έλληνας λόγω του ότι μεγάλωσα εδώ όλα αυτά τα χρόνια, κατά το μεγαλύτερο ποσοστό. Και υπάρχει μέσα μου και ένα κομμάτι φιλιάτικο το οποίο είναι το ρίζα μου, το DNA μου. Θεωρούμαστε νέοι Έλληνες. Νέα γενιά Ελλήνων. Ελλήνων που έχουν δύο κουλτούρες. Ελλήνων που έχουν, δεν είναι λευκοί. Ελλήνων που μιλάνε ελληνικά και κοιμούνται αλλιώ. Δεν μπορεί να το σταματήσει κανένα. Δεν μπορεί να σταματήσει κανένα στο ρεύμα. Έχω τον μπάσκετ πρώτα απ' όλα. Γιατί μόνο από αυτό μπορώ να εκφραστώ ή να βγάλω. Συγκεντρώνεσαι σε κάτι που θέλει να κάνει και σε δίνει στόχου. Θα είναι να πετύχει να φτάσει κάτι που θέλει. Yeah. 
So the only thing I'd like to say is uh, that the video we just uh, watched, uh, uh, this documentary, if you like, all the people we listen to, this variety of different activities uh, that all these people are involved in and also the various problems they mentioned to us. So whatever we saw in this uh, documentary, this was prepared by uh, Mr. Manelos Karamagiolis, uh, specifically for dialogues, uh, just for us, uh, so that uh, the uh, people can actually help us kick off the discussion so that we can engage in a very interesting discussion. I just uh, want uh, Mr. Karang Magyalis uh, to uh, say just a few things about what we just watched. Uh, I know it may sound stupid, but uh, what, what did we watch exactly? 
Well, what we watched is something that was shot just a couple of days ago. In the last three years, I've been uh, shooting uh, uh, different films regarding this African community without knowing why. I feel that people should guide me in these uh, documentaries. Uh, these um, uh, shootings, this footage is from last week. Uh, and uh, let me say that uh, a friend of mine uh, saw it. Uh, and uh, she made a comment and she says to me, I see them uh, moving in front uh, of uh, the um, camera, in front of the lens, and they're so happy to be in front of the lens and they're not at all ashamed or embarrassed. And uh, it's not that this is directed. Uh, there is nobody directing it. It's all spontaneous. Uh, these are the life stories of these people. Of course, there is a director, but what they say is not based on a script. Because I'm saying this because sometimes we watch something, and uh, judging from myself, uh, I can say this. We watch something, we are troubled by it, and then at the end, we feel that we've watched to film or that we've watched something that is not exactly what we saw. But here we see the truth. We see real people describing their own stories and their own problems and their own experiences. So we don't have actors here in this documentary. These are people, uh, real people, real life people. And let me say that when you see a documentary, you see that life imposes its will in these documentaries. And I'd like to say something. Peggy, who is with us today, uh, when we actually went to Fakianos Negri to shoot a scene, there was a lady that I've known for many years. We talked to one another, and she started uh, screaming abuse. And this is uh, why verbal abuse. And uh, we actually went there to see what was happening. And Peggy reacted wonderfully. She picked up her mobile phone. We were able uh, to uh, see this. And she says, OK, you're attacking me. Let me take a picture of you. And uh, let me take a photo. I think she reacted in a very cool way. This woman uh, was, uh, she was taken away. Uh, and uh, she tried to hide. And the important thing is for these people who are brave uh, should have uh, the right to speak. And I want them to participate in this discussion because when, they let, when we let their voices be heard, they can live a good life in uh, Greece. Uh, and let me say that they do a lot of remarkable things. And this is the best thing about this documentary. So it's very interesting if um, the people here in the audience uh, could talk uh, about uh, what we just watched, about this documentary. Uh, the video that was presented to us uh, by Mr. Karamagiolis, uh, Karamagiolis uh, and uh, you see that some of the people uh, in the video are with us. Uh, they're in uh, the um, audience. Uh, so do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you believe that what you saw is not exactly uh, true? But I think it's worth having this discussion, this internal discussion. This is a discussion that needs to take place. We shouldn't hide behind our fingers. We're not trying to paint a rosy picture here. So then afterwards, uh, we just keep our secrets uh, well hidden inside uh, our homes. So we would like to tell you to speak out and to tell us a little bit more about the video and what you thought about it. And what is also very interesting, and you saw this, all the heroes in uh, this uh, documentary, Loretta, she was the first person I got to meet. So all the people are not asking for alms. They're not beggars. They actually uh, vent their anger, but they're not angry, really. It's not really anger that they show, that they exhibit. They're smiling. All they want is a life worth living, a good life uh, in uh, Greece. Uh, since you talked about Loretta, Loretta, Mrs. McCauley, I uh, would like now to switch to the plural and let me personal references, uh, but uh, we have established some uh, rapport, some ties uh, with our speakers. Uh, but being the host and the journalist, I would like to speak to you in the plural out of respect and out of appreciation. Uh, let me say that, uh, let me begin that we saw you playing in a play. You were playing in a theatrical play. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. 
in a performance. So what we are trying to do is to become part of society. This is why we set up this organization. So when we established our organization the second time we met, we finally understood that there's a problem, a bigger problem than what we expected regarding children born in Greece from African parents because they didn't have citizenship. And uh, we said we need to have a campaign, to launch a campaign. We can't have racism from the crib. And in the Greek parliament, they started talking about children from African parents born in Greece. And I said before that uh, there's a lot of exploitation regarding Africa, and we always have obstacles and impediments uh, to face. Even our organization met such uh, problems. So let me say that. Uh, before uh, this uh, actually beautiful venue uh, became what it is today. We held many events, many activities. That's what we do. And uh, we asked uh, for an area as an organization in order for us to carry out our different activities, uh, outreach activities. Could you please explain to us uh, what your organization does uh, and uh, how many years has it been in existence? Well, 12 years. So what does uh, our organization do, United African Women Organization? So we're trying to become an active part of society. We organize festivals against racism. So it's a festival. Uh, combating racism so that we can become a part of society. What we're striving for is social inclusion. So right now, we have no space of our own. So we asked for a space. Uh, we wanted uh, to be able to have uh, something here, yes, in the municipal uh, market uh, of Kipseli. And they said to us that uh, we needed to have two activities first, and then they'll decide whether they will give us uh, a small area which we can use for our uh, activities. So we did that. We had two activities. And afterwards, uh, see what happened. We were not given a permanent uh, place uh, to um, work in. And uh, we do not receive uh, any funding uh, whatsoever. We owe money to the tax uh, office. Uh, we pay taxes for the organization. So where's the organization right now? Is it housed somewhere? If somebody wants to come to see you, do you have any offices? So we are in action women. That's where we are. But I wanted to ask a question. Because our organization pays taxes, and so do we, uh, we are not uh, uh, people that don't have to pay taxes, uh, so we're not exempt. So the question is, why can't they give us a space where we can uh, carry out various activities? Let me say that women from Africa have entered your houses as uh, house cleaners, uh, as maids, uh, as servants. Uh, we clean the house. Uh, that's what we've been forced to do. We know the Greek family. We organized ourselves. We organize ourselves to become an active part of society so that Greeks can get to know us and stop being racists because uh, sometimes they think uh, that uh, we uh, actually live here and uh, that the Greeks pay taxes and not us. So my question is, why is it that our organization pays taxes without getting anything in return? We have no space. I don't know if there's anyone, any representative from the municipal market of Athens here. Maybe we'd like to hear the other side of the story. So could we give the gentleman the microphone, please? Person from the municipal market of Kipseli. Thank you. Christine. So, hello, welcome. This is from Impact Hub, uh, from the uh, municipal market of Kipseli. So, the story of this municipal market, I don't know if we had uh, the time to discuss this. This is a historic building. It was an old market. Uh, so when uh, many supermarkets started operating in the area, the shops in the market started closing down. The people working inside the municipal market who had shops here were forced uh, to uh, go elsewhere. 
So they were going to turn this market into a parking space. So this beautiful building would have been demolished uh, and this parking would have been created in its place in order to meet the parking needs. There were some inhabitants who managed to salvage the building. It's a listed building. So it was uh, squatted in, uh, there were squatters or uh, they occupied it for eight years. And afterwards this uh, actually uh, occupation was ended. Uh, this this uh, market was renovated by the municipality of Athens, and for four or five years, the uh, municipality has conceded it. Uh, but there is a challenge. It must cover its operating expenses. It must cover administrative expenses as well. So it can be a meeting place for the community. This is why we have the Ukrainian festival, the Ethiopian festival. We call different communities to work together. So let's just give an answer to the question posed uh, by the lady. Why can't you give some space uh, to the ladies organization? Well, we've discussed this. Uh, there is space, but we must always remember that all organizations organizations and all actions have to be viable because otherwise uh, how are we going to do everything? We have to uh, pay taxes, we have to clean the market, we have to do so with enthusiasm and passion and we've worked with the Nigerian community, the Ethiopian community. So we'd like to work closely with the United African Women Organizations so that we can do something wonderful together. Thank you very much. I want you to continue this discussion and I hope this will continue after this uh, shorter discussion. That's all I had to say. But uh, since uh, we also heard about the other uh, communities that are active here, let me say, do you communicate with one another? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes, we do have communication. So, uh, we had called for a um, community that was going to hold an activity here, and they told me they didn't pay. So that's what they told me, at least. So this is hearsay. So they said that um, we were told we had to pay. So, Mr. Dubidan, do we know the exact number of Africans living in Greece? I'm not certain if we can know the exact figure. We had, uh, in fact, uh, a better idea of, of the number a while back. When my uh, parents had first come to uh, Greece, and there were students at the time, something that uh, people might not know is that uh, migration in Greece does not um, actually uh, it's not something that started with the migratory uh, crisis, nor was it uh, caused in 2005 from the war in Afghanistan, nor uh, when the um, borders with Albania opened, but it started many years ago because we tend to uh, talk about the more recent event. And uh, we talk about how we're going to socially uh, integrate those people who have recently come. It's as if we've actually resolved the issue of social integration for those people who have come many years back. And I'd like to revert to what I said before. In the past, it was uh, easier to um, calculate for the African community, at least, what our figures were because uh, it was easier for them to be organized. So in their uh, overwhelming majority, it was people who had come and had lived for quite a while in Greece and who knew Greek, and they had the uh, opportunity to go to uh, Greek university, like my parents. And uh, it was easier for them to be part of uh, the social fabric. And that is uh, when they had the student union I think that it was, um, in fact, uh, something that people my parents' age will know of. And according to calculations in those times, the number of Africans who lived in Greece was more than 10,000. More than 10,000 in Athens. More than 10,000 in Athens. 
of course, this uh, figure actually uh, does not reflect uh, the present day reality. People have left. Yes, uh, we see that there are a lot of families, a lot of people who have decided to uh, go back home or at least uh, to uh, seek a better future for themselves and their uh, families in certain other countries uh, of uh, the European Union or Europe. And of course, we have a lot fewer than we did uh, years ago because we did have, in fact, the economic crisis started uh, at the end of 2009 until recently. I think it is uh, very interesting what you said in the beginning, that when we actually uh, launch this discussion in Greece, we shouldn't uh, actually limit uh, ourselves to the refugees or the migratory uh, flows of the recent past and present because uh, this is not something that has been curbed yet or when Al the borders with Albania opened but when we yeah, are looking at the present day 2019 uh, with respect to your activities also in the uh, Generation to Zero initiative and you as uh, the representative of the second generation how can you talk about uh, this need for integration at all levels of youth, and not only youth, so that we can actually yeah, say that even though we are looking back so many years, um, we still have uh, problems here faced by uh, young people in the present day. Now, let me talk a bit about our uh, organization, about we, what we do. So this initiative started at the end of 2005, beginning of 2006. And uh, we did it in order to uh, actually um, try to make certain that the kids uh, born and raised in Greece uh, could actually obtain citizenship. And we had a political campaign. We did lobbying and we did whatever is needed in order to ensure that we um, actually had awareness raising in, with respect to uh, the second generation, and we wanted to change the legal framework. And this is what enables uh, somebody to be uh, a Greek citizen. So we wanted to change the uh, citizenship uh, code. And that happened uh, in uh, 2010 with the enactment of the first uh, law, 3838. We had also certain adventures, I would term them, and uh, two years later, it was uh, deemed uh, unconstitutional. And then we had a new campaign, and a new law was enacted. So there is a need there. The need for integration is, in fact, a part of people's nature. Yes, of course, because people are social beings. But I wonder, how is it possible, after so many decades have passed, as you said in your uh, first comment, that now in 2019, we're still talking about how the second generation will in fact uh, become part of Greek society. As we're here in Gibsalian, we've actually launched this discussion here. I think it's important to discuss this, how so many years later, we're still talking about something that's self-evident. I think we could even be talking about this for two years days. Do you think that Greeks are racist? Is it xenophobia? Is it something that's um, the fault of the state? No, no. I think it's political will and political will alone. It is up to the uh, uh, will of the state to actually uh, take the necessary measures. And I think that we were able to influence at the time by running our campaign in the last few years and we were able to influence things in order to have a law. And we're still fighting the good fight. We um, are trying to ensure social integration of uh, refugees and migrants. And uh, we are doing, uh, in fact, uh, our advocacy work in order to protect these people's rights. And we're approaching the state uh, Wherein lies the uh, problem of violating such rights? Is it, uh, in fact, the labor market? Well, 
when there's a person within society who feels, in fact, marginalized, I think that that is a, a violation of their human rights in general. I don't think that we should enter into uh, details about those uh, rights that are violated, but a person who lives, breathes, and tries to create because not every actually achieves it, because there are very many difficulties uh, associated with such efforts, and people strive, but they don't always achieve. So when all these people have been trying for years on end, and they're not able to overcome all these issues related to the social integration, well, that means that we have not actually managed to reach the appropriate decisions at a state level. And we have not actually engaged in action that will allow people to become integrated. Now, a question which I think can be uh, something that comes to mind to uh, the minds of many people here. So the question is, what happens? And I would like to refer to uh, Adada Kumbo. It's an example that we heard also in the video that for a lot of families, it was a luxury for their children to be involved in sports. But thanks to Yanis, thanks to Thanasis, his uh, brother, we see there's a change of mindset. Uh, and we see that uh, it was, in fact, uh, something that uh, paved the way for all young uh, boys and girls who are interested in sports more generally. I want to ask what this means for Greece. What is Adedogumbo's, in fact, example? I read an article in New York Times that uh, actually explained how, on one side of the coin, this person who has become in fact, a symbol has actually uh, changed uh, uh, and um, gone to the other side of the uh, coin. So from the Greece, where we see uh, the difficult conditions uh, for people who come to Greece or for people who are born in our country, who are, uh, in fact, uh, Greek citizens and who have Greek citizenship, how we've turned our back on them. And we know some of us know this and some of us don't. But that's how uh, society is. Uh, some people forge ahead uh, knowingly, and others uh, are a bit more naive. And uh, now people are looking uh, at uh, the uh, US uh, basketball, NBA, and uh, in fact, he's the top player there. And you, you see how this is uh, so far removed from Greece. And we feel suddenly that uh, he is somebody who uh, honors us and who becomes the uh, Greek ambassador. And um, I think that this is something that should uh, uh, trouble us a bit. I'm saying that this is uh, something that has been commented from the f uh, foreign press. <laughs> So our hypocrisy on this matter, well, I think everybody could think about it. I wouldn't comment on it any further because we'll all think about it and draw our own conclusions. But the most interesting thing is how this had an impact on uh, Afro-Greeks, uh, on uh, their families, because we actually wondered, are you all not going to become uh, NBA uh, basketball players like Atendo Kumbo? And the children said, well, that's not it. Uh, all the children that I've seen and that I've included in my documentary, they all have a plan B. Russell, who's here, said, no, for me, basketball is my number one choice, but he also has a plan B. So the interesting is, thing is that their families were difficult to, to um, persuade, and the children themselves, they didn't really know much about basketball. They played football more than basketball in the beginning, but uh, the same coach who actually founded Ndokumbo when he was young now goes around and visits different neighborhoods with 
African families. He sees the kids, so he makes them play basketball, gets to teach them about basketball, and then they enter important uh, teams, but they're not hooked on basketball. They're not obsessed with basketball. I'd ask Mikael, uh, who was on the video, or Peggy, to tell us what they think about their lives, because they have a plan as to what they want to do in their life. So I'll ask them. Let's give the microphone to these uh, two young people. Hello. Can you hear me? Is it working? So first of all, I would like to make a comment on what Manello said earlier. In a way, we were actually like fish out of water, gasping for breath uh, in front of the camera. Uh, we uh, didn't really want to be part of this video. Why? Because from a very young age, uh, for generations now, there's always uh, an interest in exploring the lives of Africans and how they live and what they go through. So what that we live and what we go through may be similar to what everybody else is going through and experiencing because sometimes people think that their problems are the biggest problems in the world. But apart from that, what we uh, learned not only in Greece but elsewhere is how to overcome your problems or how uh, not to let uh, your problems uh, make you fall on the ground. So despite the difficulties we've encountered, what we want is for the next generations not to encounter the same problems as we encountered. So what we do, most of us at least, is uh, to educate and empower young children, particularly when it comes to art and sports. Atento Kumbo, Yanis Atento Kumbo, the only thing that he did different uh, from other kids is to empower himself and to help himself uh, by encouraging himself. And I think it's very important for somebody to be there to give a helping hand. And uh, we see that you're working in goodies, but you have a dream. What's your dream exactly? My dream is to open up an institute uh, for young talent. Thank you very much, and for people to acquire skills. Hello, my name is Mikkel. I would like to make a comment on one particular thing. We've been talking about it in Dokumbo. Uh, for some time now. He's one of us. Atendo Kumbo is one of us who became a very well-known basketball player in the NBA. But I don't want in the future to see a Greece, to see Greece where everybody who's colored uh, can wake up in the morning and say, I want to do one, two, three. No, I want uh, colored people, people of mixed race, to be able to think of a million possibilities. They can be a police officer, a doctor, a lawyer. So we want to have infinite possibilities, equal possibilities with everybody else. It's not just basketball or football or anything like that. I want to be capable of doing whatever I like, which may be anything at all. So. As a community, and I'm not talking about a separate, uh, uh, separate Africans and the Greeks separately, we must think as one. We are one, the Greeks and the Africans. So we want to see something better than what we have right now. And I just want to say one thing, one last thing. To get, um, I have some friends, uh, some young children, and we've created something which we believe will be a way to help uh, young uh, people of African descent, but also young people in general. This is an organization, an organization uh, which deals with artistic creation, because we believe that Greece as a country and we Afri Greeks uh, more than ever before need to express ourselves. There's this need to express ourselves through dance, through music, through theater, through all these different, uh, if you like, uh, um, 
ways of doing things. So we have CIRLAT, it's an organization. Uh, we have created this organization, and we want to help uh, uh, actually young talent uh, flourish. And we see that a lot of young people have not been able to develop their talent, uh, and they went to waste. Why? Because nobody gave them a chance. Nobody opened the door for them. I don't want this to happen again. This is why we decided to do something about it, and this is why we've created our organization. Thank you. Sorry, I know I'm speaking uh, and hogging the microphone. So in order for uh, such organizations uh, to be created and in order for us to have a lot of uh, these activities taking place, we need to help one another. That's a, a start. And the lady said uh, she's got an organization that's been in existence for 12 whole years. It's a 12-year organization, and she can't be given one day here, one day for an activity here. That sounds really weird. So I think that if this were to change, this would make me a very happy person. Thank you. Well, I'd like to congratulate both, both of our young people. What uh, Africa wants most is freedom. As I said before, in the past there was slavery in Africa. And they used to chain us in our hands and our feet. We were shackled. And uh, people said, they're not uh, animals. Do away with these shackles. Let's do away with slavery. But what did they do? They actually made it invisible. So I'm sitting here with an invisible shackle. Nobody actually sees this shackle, but that is what makes it most difficult. I would like to recount a short story, something that made me change mindset completely. Well, I'd like to say that I played basketball a lot, but basketball didn't love me. So, thankfully, I had a person close to me, as uh, the guy said, as uh, Manolo said, Spiros Velignadis. Spiros Velignadis uh, doesn't simply yet create basketball players, um, but he's, in fact, uh, somebody who taught me that, okay, if you don't play basketball, you can actually uh, do very uh, many other things because you appear to be smart. And uh, you won't actually uh, be lost. And uh, there was something that traumatized me, even though it uh, was not something that uh, affected me personally. When I um, actually uh, first started out in our organization, when we had the formal team, and when we did the focus groups, and we uh, spoke with younger children from amongst us, we had two uh, kids who were, uh, in fact, uh, of African descent, and they said, well, Nico, we're 17 or 18 years of age, and we'd like to find a job, a job to support my family. But I don't want just any job. And, OK, I thought well, I'm going to hear something uh, good here. They said, we want, actually, to find a job where we uh, are not visible. We want, in fact, a job where we can be hidden. And uh, we want a job which is suitable for black people. And, you know, that really shocked me. I was awestruck. And that is how I understood how big a problem this was. And that there was a lack of incentive for young people who envisage a better future. And I thought that this is what we must focus on. And that's how we created this informal team and how it actually evolved so that we can actually inspire younger kids so we can give them incentive that somebody who might have been a migrant, despite all these impediments and these difficult conditions around us, 
these that these problems that we experience will have the persistence and uh, the uh, possibility to actually attain a level that they want and uh, not to be like many of the other kids that decided when they found themselves before the same impasse. I also found the same impasse because I don't have a different background. Well, what we want is to give them an, another way out so they don't only think about leaving Greece. And we discussed that at length. And we said, if we go to Germany, to Austria, to uh, States, your uh, color will not change. So you'll go there. And there will be certain people there also who will actually uh, consider that you uh, should be at a disadvantage because they think that you should be two or three uh, steps below them. And we had to give incentives to these uh, young people to create here. I think that we should all create. And I think that this actually... Uh, we should all do this. We are fated to succeed because there's nothing that um, is a given fact for this young generation. I know that most families don't have assets and it's like you start your life from scratch. And uh, this was something that really shocked me, but it gave me uh, a huge push to actually yeah, enhance uh, our team and make it into an organization and to uh, actually become more engaged. Well, we know that you have a large scope in your organization. You're not only interested in socialization and the integration of people who uh, are of African descent only, but other migrants from other parts of the world, correct? Yes. From an institutional standpoint, are you working with the state bodies, organizations, um, other organizations of these exist that are so developed as your own that undertakes a similar uh, job or tasks as you. Well, let us uh, actually elaborate a bit about the collaborations. Yes, when we have to actually take action, we uh, uh, speak to institutional organizations. We speak with the state, with the ministries. We actually uh, provide uh, our uh, observations, feedback, and proposals. There is uh, cooperation. Of course, it is uh, our organization that initiates this uh, contact and collaboration. Now, if we are to talk about collaboration with other organizations, organizations from civil society. It does exist, but it could be greatly enhanced. That's my answer. So um, I'd like to say, yeah, if we are to look, uh, Mr. Kouliaris, about what is happening here in Greece and what uh, we perceive or what we actually turn a blind eye to. And uh, certain things that Mrs. Macaulay talked about, about the shackles, be they visible or invisible. Let us see what's happening globally. And uh, where Africa finds itself now compared to the rest of the world. Let's talk about the African diaspora. The African diaspora has greatly contributed to world civilization. You saw it from the video that we just watched. Uh, you heard this from the young people who spoke just earlier. So modern music is based on uh, what was done by the African diaspora. Jazz, Jamaican reggae, Brazilian saba, spirituals, uh, gospel, pop, rock, all this music uh, is based on African music, the music of the African diaspora. This is a great contribution of the African diaspora to the world civilization. Of course, we're talking about 250 million uh, Greek, uh, Africans, uh, mostly in Latin America uh, and specifically in Brazil. 
the uh, overwhelming majority of Brazilians, over 50 percent, uh, have African roots. In the U.S., uh, they uh, constitute 15 percent of the population. We also had uh, the uh, first uh, Afro-American president of the U.S. Uh, so Loretta talked about the shackles, these invisible shackles. I don't think that these uh, can only be found on African migrants or immigrants. Uh, all immigrants uh, all over the world uh, have uh, actually experienced uh, these invisible and visible obstacles uh, that were put in their way. And we also have two representatives from the South African Embassy, the Greek uh, immigrants uh, in South Africa up until the 1950s were not considered by the apartheid regime whites. They were included in the non-whites. Up until Favourd, uh, the uh, president who was an admirer of the Nazis, uh, saw the white population going down, and he then included the Greeks as whites. And then he used the famous phrase, the Greeks are lucky. So the Greeks are lucky. That's what Favourd said. Uh, so color, color, historically speaking, white uh, being white or black, it changes depending on the times and the conditions, the prevailing conditions. In the Middle Ages, the Italian immigrants in France were considered black. So I think that we should forget color. Let's put color aside. And we all have different shades of skin, right? All uh, Greek women want to become blonde, and all North European uh, blonde women want to become dark and swarthy skinned. So the color really doesn't matter. We just want to be different from one another. We want to distinguish ourselves from the others. And color is the first thing that we look at. And sometimes people actually make small differences uh, appear larger than life. Take us to Africa. Tell us more about Africa. Let us uh, actually um, think of Africa, because I think the value of this discussion is for us to at least open our eyes and not to uh, see something new, but something that we don't see even though it's right in front of us. It's hidden in plain sight. And you told me some days ago that uh, we know very little about Africa, maybe nothing at all. So just give us some basic information regarding Africa and the multiple speeds developing in Africa. Mr. Musuris talked about the terra incognita. This is an unknown uh, continent, but it is so diverse. It's the most diverse continent in the world. We have the difference between the Greeks and the Swedes, cultural differences uh, appearance-wise, but this is nothing comparing the Darfuri, the Shona, the Amal to the Hausa. So it's a country with a lot of diversity. Uh, Africa has one-sixth of the global population and one-third of the languages spoken in the world. So it's a very diverse continent, the most diverse. Here, the children uh, talked about African diaspora. North Africans don't consider themselves Africans. There's an organization, is there an organization of African immigrants in Greece that contains Libyans, Tunisians, Algerians, Egyptians, or Moroccan? Yes, we do. Women, some women. Women, women. So the overwhelming majority, if you go to Cairo, for example, and uh, you say, I'm so happy to be in Africa. I once went to Cairo, and they all looked at me strangely when I said that I was happy to be in Africa. They don't consider themselves Africa or part of Africa. So what is Africa? to visitors. It's one of the cheapest countries in the world, uh, Lilongwe in Malawi. And you can also have the most expensive country, Luanda in Angola. So in Africa, you have uh, countries like Sierra Leone, which was one of the poorest countries, but you also have Botswana, which since the 1960s has the highest growth rate in the world, uh, greater than China, higher than China. 
I just want to correct you. Sierra Leone is not the poorest country in Africa because it has diamonds. It has a lot of natural resources. The only thing that makes Sierra Leone the poor country is exploitation. That's what I said from the outset. But natural resources uh, do not secure growth. Japan is the poorest uh, country in natural resources. It has very few, but it has one of the highest per capita incomes. The Congo has uh, a lot of mineral uh, wealth. It was called Scandal Geologique by the Belgians, a geological scandal. It's one of the poorest countries. And Botswana next to it uh, has a high growth rate and it has a lot of uh, diamonds. So uh, what has made it uh, rich countries that uh, the democratic, if you like, uh, institutions? Is it uh, that it has good leaders? You said something about democracy. Matia Sen said that democracy means growth. And Africa now has achieved great progress in terms of democracy with the help of South Africa. So Nelson Mandela left a legacy. He left a legacy, and this was continued by Becky, unfortunately not by Zuma. And uh, Africa became uh, more democratic uh, than in the past. Please uh, speak closer to the microphone. So what does this actually mean? It means that there is more freedom, there's more control, more checks and balances, and better governance. And this is something that we need to stress. Why? Because Africa has more peace than before. And remember that we wrote an article together. We co-authored an article, more peace, more democracy, and more growth. So right now, Africa has increased its GDP by 4%, and it managed to have a an increase in GDP of 5 to 6 percent. Ethiopia, for many years, had a 10 percent increase in GDP. And Ethiopia is one of the wonders in Africa. It's slowly becoming one of the uh, fastest uh, growing countries. So we have the new leader of Ethiopia, and uh, the new leader in South Africa will also play a great role in the growth of Africa. I went to Rwanda recently. In 1994, you had a terrible genocide, 800,000 dead people. Now, if you visit Rwanda today, you will be impressed. So if you visit Rwanda today, you will be impressed, uh, impressed uh, by the great progress that has been achieved in this country. The roads are spectacular. They are spotless. I've never seen a cleaner city than Kingali, no matter uh, where I've been. I've never seen a country that is so well organized. Uh, so the third world, Loretta talked about the third world. Well, this is a fabrication of the Cold War. The first uh, war uh, world was the West, the second was the communist countries, and the third world were the countries that wanted to go on a separate path. Unfortunately, the word third world has now taken on a negative connotation. And sometimes we say that this is third world. This is an expression they use in Greece, and I said, if only it were the case. I don't know who said that. But uh, I believe uh, that this growth regarding Africa, I am from Africa, I come from Africa. So let me say that uh, yeah, what I truly believe is that Africa has uh, growth and uh, that uh, it, uh, something was mentioned by the gentleman earlier. He said something about uh, GDP growth. But the thing is, when uh, things are do so good and when things are booming, then Africans won't leave the country. That's the only time when I think uh, that things will be OK. But Africans keep leaving uh, Africa. They keep uh, immigrating to other countries. And now you see that the European Union is actually working um, together with dictators in Africa. So slavery has changed. It's a new type of slavery. May I intervene and may I add to what Loretta said? Let me just say something about Rwanda myself, because I had the same experience when I visited Rwanda. In Rwanda, there's no plastic. It's a country without plastic. And here in uh, Europe, uh, we uh, know uh, what's happening. And we see what's happening in Greece, because uh, with the environment, there's a problem. And in Rwanda, we have a lot of women parliamentarians, more 
of and elsewhere. So a lot's happening by way of democracy in Rwanda, and I think we could enter into a long discussion regarding this matter. But let's look at the link, the connection between Africa and the rest of the world and the policies in the rest of the world. And let's look at our share, our uh, share as to what's happening in Africa. And I'd like to add to what Loretta said. Let me tell you about Senegal, my experience from Senegal. I mentioned this as an example, but in ActionAid in general, we used to use the Chinese proverb, which means if you give a, a person a fish, uh, he will eat for one day. If you teach this person how to fish, he'll be able to fish for the rest of his life. And this uh, was a, a work model. This had to do with how we worked in the African communities. But I think we have surpassed uh, this, uh, actually, um, proverb. Uh, we've gone past that, because uh, in ActionAid, I understood that they know how to fish fish very well. The problem is not that we teach them how to fish. Senegalese are the best fishermen in the world. Their problem is to be able to uh, respect their right to fish, to go fishing. So I saw that this is a country, 3 million people, 600,000 out of these people live uh, from fishing, directly or indirectly. And the fish is the only animal protein they can consume. So there, with the agreements that we've entered into with the EU, these international fishing companies are pillaging the oceans uh, off the coast of Senegal. So they are uh, sweeping the seas clean. And what's happened all these years is the Senegalese fishermen who have canoes and fishing nets uh, find no fish to catch. The stocks have been depleted. So they take the canoe and they're in their water and they go out uh, to the uh, deep sea and they come back with no fish. So what is their only solution? To take their canoe and come in quest for a better life to the Mediterranean. And here they find a wall. A wall is erected in front of them. And let me put it bluntly, they drown. They drown because they're not allowed to reach the shore. This is a vicious circle, the vicious circle of poverty facing African countries. It's a system that needs to change. It's a vicious circle, and we have to break that circle. Oh, this actually, yeah, growth in Africa. But as we speak, as the girls uh, fall pregnant uh, and uh, they're happy about it, but uh, there they die. They die on a daily basis. What type of growth is that? The um, life expectancy in Africa is not the same as in the West. And if I uh, live uh, long, I think I'll have to actually wait a long time for uh, Africa to um, um, actually yeah, grow. But Loretta, the life expectancy has increased by 10 years. But that's a drop in the ocean. That's what I know. Well, I think that uh, it is uh, very far removed from the uh, West. But there is, um, in fact, progress. But as we talked about Rwanda, in 1994, when we had the genocide in Rwanda, Greece had the presidency of the European Union. And uh, there was a proposal then of certain diplomats just before the genocide for the Troika to go there. The Troika was made up of France, or rather Belgium, and uh, Germany, together with Greece. This was the previous uh, presidency and the uh, presidency after Greece. So when the matter was uh, put, the Belgians and the Germans said yes. So uh, the uh, Greek uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs said, well, now it's Rwanda that's, in fact, on the top of our agenda. Mm. So I want to say that indifference is something that uh, plays a huge role. I think that this is critical. Of course, we have uh, exploitation. Uh, this exists, and nobody, um, in fact, refutes this. But we have to actually uh, turn our attention to look at this forgotten part of the world. OK, you've actually cited examples also in the beginning. And we see uh, strong uh, centers, strong uh, players uh, globally to actually uh, turn the gaze towards Africa. But why does uh, Greece still show indifference and to this great extent? And I've actually said it time and again. I don't want to become tiring, but uh, I actually uh, know this 
I see it from public discourse. Um, I see this from the uh, world of uh, media and from our society and from our discussions. We don't know about Africa. We don't discuss about Africa. Could I yes, say a few things? But I'd like you to respond to this point because uh, it concerns us all. Yes, I wanted to broach that exact subject. And I wanted to say that uh, this initiative today of uh, the Establishing House Foundation is very important. And uh, we uh, would have liked to have seen this uh, many years ago. 35 years ago, I gave an interview and I said that when the South will come North, we will be, in fact, unprepared. And our state has done no nothing, no effort whatsoever in order to create a policy for migration. So that's the first problem. And the second problem is that the migrants who came did not have the opportunity to come into contact with the uh, Greek people, as is the case uh, today. We see that uh, if you come into contact uh, with each other, many things can change. And I think that what you're doing here is very important, and we have to actually foster it as much as we can. But what happens afterwards? What happens the day after? Because we see that we have people here Uh, represents not so much of the state, which is, in fact, uh, the most important, but we have, in fact, networks, agency organizations. The day after is the most important. We are here, but we're going to leave. What was going to, what's going to happen afterwards? I think there is an interest here with respect to Africa that we are trying in the uh, African uh, Chamber, Hellenic African Chamber, to promote. And we must say that Mr. Julialis is the uh, only professor who of the university that was interested in Africa. Now, let's come to what Lotter said. We say that uh, in uh, Africa, we had incursions uh, three times. One was the colonialism, and uh, the second was uh, Cold War. And they used uh, the Africans as uh, representatives for conflict between uh, the West and uh, the Soviet bloc. And now there's a third incursion, a third invasion. So we see that uh, Africa is of interest for the businesses. So this is a third exploitation of Africa. And we see China that has, in fact, uh, entered Africa to a great extent. Do you know that 350 embassies were established in African countries? Turkey alone has established 26 embassies. Erdogan has gone 20 times to the African countries. Turkey has, in fact, a basis in Somalia. and. Um, I won't continue. So, as we speak, there is this invasion of the uh, major uh, countries and of uh, huge multinationals. So the question being uh, how Africa negotiates with these uh, new economic invaders. And that is why we need to actually foster an integration of Africa, a single market. And this would allow uh, for regional integration, and an effort is being made. And I'm very uh, optimistic. And uh, three countries are uh, going to launch a program of uh, zero tariffs amongst European countries. So when we have a single Africa rather than 52 uh, um, entities, and uh, we will be able to negotiate better. And uh, I think this would also work uh, curb uh, corruption, which is rife. Uh, there's also a lot of poverty because there's a lot of uh, inequalities. There are a lot of people who have made a lot of money, and that's the problem. So that is why we need to have a regional integration. Efforts have been made. I worked, in fact, one year to create a single market for the Western Africa, and this was a failure because uh, the uh, um, heads of government and state didn't want to give an inch of their sovereignty. They wanted to be gods there. And I'd like to note that the African diaspora in uh, Greece, not the young kids, but the previous uh, generation, were divided uh, with respect to those who were from the French-speaking or English-speaking countries that didn't speak to each other. Now, I'd like to add something here. I said that we still have shackles. There are people here that are in Greece for more than 40 years, and they don't have a residence permit. So they don't have the permit. And there is, in fact, a category of people here from Africa 
And we're talking about the first generation now. So they actually delayed in uh, filing their papers. They were actually yeah, not actually um, allowed to uh, submit their papers uh, for nationality in 10 years' time. So uh, they create impediments and problems for us. It's not, these are problems are not caused by us, and that's why I say we still have shackles. I'd like to ask Mr. Musuris a question. You talked about the effort you undertook and uh, the relations between Africa and uh, Greece or Greece and various African countries uh, through the uh, Hellenic uh, African uh, Chamber of Commerce of Trade and Development. Tell us about the efforts you've made so far and tell us about the results, the outcome of these efforts. But please be brief because we have to continue. So the results are not as good as expected. Unfortunately, for financial reasons, we can't bring African leaders here. We only did it once. And uh, so that these uh, African leaders could uh, inform uh, the uh, Greek people and the Greek business community. So we try to make do with what we have. A lot of uh, business delegations uh, go to Africa. Greek businessmen travel to Africa. There are some. Uh, companies that have uh, gone to Africa and they've done well so far in Africa. But things haven't moved as much as I would have liked to. But what are your relations uh, with the Greek entrepreneurs who are doing business in Africa, more specifically in Nigeria? Because I happen to know a couple of them there. And uh, we know that some of these uh, Greek businessmen happen to be members uh, of ours, and they continue to be active. There are some big uh, companies. You know them, but these are huge companies. Uh, and uh, they keep growing. They keep going from strength to strength. Uh, off mic, we can't hear what is being said. Uh, Flora Mills, Flora Mills, uh, Levendis's companies. One actually makes flour, a uh, flour mill. It's a flour mill, and they actually produce flour. And uh, we have different industries. Uh, so we can't hear what the speaker is saying, unfortunately, because the microphone is not on. Now it's on, because you said something. You said that you support Africa in this way. This is why I said it. We, we missed the rest. We support uh, financial relations between Greece and Africa. And we also support uh, the knowledge. We want to increase the knowledge of Greeks about Africa. But how do you support the Africans through these actions? The Africans, uh, with the Africans in Greece, we have no relations. What about the Africans in Africa? The Africans in Africa, well, we cannot uh, actually uh, do something. Uh, we don't have the means to do so. So it's one-sided, but we have people reporting to us uh, on what's happening there. So you're talking about a closed group of Greeks uh, who do business, uh, just like the Chinese, the Belgians, and so on and so forth, if I'm not mistaken. Well, look. Uh, when it comes to economics and economic relations, there's a win-win situation. Both win. It's a win-win situation. But it's what the colonialists always did. Uh, you can't always have a win-win. But now let's not talk about the capitalist system. No, we should talk about the capitalist system and about capitalism because capitalism is largely to blame for what Africa is going through when you have tax havens which allow for the money made by companies doing business in Africa to take it all out. And this is double what the African countries get as humanitarian aid. So if they take out all this money and send it to tax havens without actually giving any tax revenues to the African countries, of course, this is very bad. How would you interpret the growth of Eastern Asia that opened its doors to multinationals and uh, where we had the same corrupt elites. Uh, 
as in Africa. So it's easy to provide easy answers. That's the easy part. But economic uh, growth is more complex as a phenomenon. And uh, if you actually see what's happening in Africa, you'll see that countries with the highest uh, income and the highest growth rates are those which accepted a lot of foreign companies. And the poorest countries are the ones that never accepted many foreign companies uh, to do business uh, in uh, their territory. So based on uh, my knowledge, I can assure you, first of all, that uh, yes, indeed, there are many things that one can say uh, about uh, capital fleeing the country, leaving the country, this drain of capital, about actually uh, people embezzling funds that would have been used for humanitarian aid. But that's half of the story. There's another side uh, which has many success stories, many people who actually helped themselves, but they also helped uh, the African countries they settled in, they settled down in. And let us uh, know, let us not forget that African investments also exist in Greece. So what do you mean by that? You can ask Mr. Mavridis. Uh, uh, so we had, uh, Mr. Mavridis is uh, from uh, the South African Embassy. So Nova Cable TV, that's an African investment. It's a South African investment. And one last question, I don't want to bother you. The money that you raise, the money you collect uh, with all these companies, have you distributed this money in order to help the African community? in Greece so that they can actually grow? Have you helped uh, civil society? Have you actually uh, tried to carry out a survey on how you can best help uh, these African communities? Is this a question that's addressed to you? Because you said that you help African communities and Africa as a continent in your own way. Of course, uh, you do have something to gain from all of this. Uh, there is is uh, this uh, element as well. But how do you actually support African communities? Mr. Juliaras is a professor. I think that Mr. Musuris uh, is the best uh, person to answer this question. Or another member of the chamber, uh, the uh, Hellenic African Chamber uh, of uh, Trade and Development. <laughs> So I think that we're the only um, university in Greece that has African studies, and I had a lot of uh, students from Africa who um, have, in fact, gone on to have uh, good careers. So I think that says it all. Now, the issue of what happens in a foreign investment in Africa depends on the negotiation between the government uh, of that African country with the uh, foreign company. So if the negotiations are good, and I must say that I worked nine years in the UN in the uh, sector of multinationals. So sending consultants to African countries so that they can learn there to negotiate with multinationals in order to have a better profit from their operations. But this is not something that can be done by the Hellenic African Chamber. We uh, cannot do this because we have one person who works um, in fact, uh, on an ongoing basis, but because we don't have, in fact, the finances. And I think that uh, PP E and Shell actually um, um, are multinationals and they export um, oil. So uh, I don't think you're referring to them, are you? Well, I wanted to say that uh, the um, um, multinationals in Africa are like BP and Shell. So uh, this is something that uh, pertains to the few and not to the many. So just please use the microphones. Uh, my name is Adonis Mavridis. I'm a member of the uh, chamber. Perhaps we've actually uh, forgotten what the purposes of the chamber is. It is a multilateral um, chamber. There are also the uh, bilateral ones. We have uh, the uh, Greek Zambian, etc. So we uh, actually uh, 
represent most countries of sub-Saharan Africa, but we also have another one that represents uh, those of North Africa. So we uh, do not actually collect resources in order to uh, uh, distribute it to the members of the community. So it actually uh, promotes, if somebody is interested in finding uh, opportunities um, um, from Greece towards Africa to bring them into contact. If they uh, are, uh, in fact, uh, businesses or private individuals or state organizations that are interested in actually uh, working with them in Greece to bring them in contact with the uh, Greek entrepreneurs. So we see that if a company secures jobs that would like to uh, actually um, hire, if there was a business that came from uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa to employ people who uh, speak the language and culture. So that's the purpose. Now, the chamber actually uh, does a very good uh, job of uh, creating uh, knowledge and opportunities uh, with respect to the uh, African sub-Saharan uh, continent. So. Uh, I would like to say that the um, Ellen, the uh, Hellenic African Chamber is uh, creating the European Partnership for Africa. So this is, uh, in fact, something that has to do with the trade between EU and Africa to do away with tariffs. This will help, uh, in fact, uh, to help us um, truly in trade because whatever is imported uh, from uh, Africa towards uh, Greece uh, um, and towards the EU would be without uh, duties. And it's as if uh, there was, in fact, uh, uh, somebody uh, doing business within the EU. So uh, that's what the uh, Chamber does. So thank you. Leaving the scope of uh, businesses and all those who actually uh, do business uh, in all ways and to the various points raised and all the disagreements that have uh, been, um, in fact, uh, stated and all the different uh, perspectives heard. I think that uh, you have seen through uh, uh, your work, Mr. Kouvaras, in ActionAid in a broader context. As we're here in the uh, municipal market of Kipsegli, and we are, in fact, uh, opening up this major chapter that is called Africa. And of course, it cannot be exhausted in one or two hours, but neither one or two days or weeks for that matter. So would it uh, be meaningful? And I'd like to ask Lena Vlavianou, the head of communication of the State of Transnational Foundation, to explain to us so that we can actually uh, make it understood how the uh, Foundation actually um, acts through its uh, charitable works because it operates in more than 100 uh, countries worldwide. How can we actually understand what is the uh, way of thinking? What is the uh, purpose and target? And in such a difficult uh, landscape, how can somebody, and indeed an international foundation that is internationally recognized, how can it actually um, separate and evaluate how, when, and who to support? Well, good evening. Um, I would like to um, actually say, as Anna did, the Stavros Nautilus Foundation that organizes the dialogues also is, in fact, a not-for-profit organization which uh, operates internationally. So I would like to... Um, continue on uh, from what uh, from where we left off in the previous discussion there's actually uh, nothing to uh, gain anywhere in the world so we actually uh, work through grants uh, grants uh, made to other non-for-profit organizations so we don't actually give grants to individuals we have in fact um, quite an extensive uh, set of um, actions also in Africa now you know, and Mrs. Macaulay said that before, that we're talking about a continent with a lot of diversity. And so there, there is, in fact, extensive pluralism in terms of history, culture, nationalities, um, languages, uh, customs, uh, geographical uh, particularities, and um, 
at school. We uh, also uh, had learned about the landlocked states, and there are a lot of differences from one uh, community to another. So we're not naive to believe that with one action we could, or the, but I would like to say that we had more than 100 grants uh, in Africa in recent years, but we know that we're very few and very small compared to this challenge, the challenge of helping a continent. So we're not a state mechanism, so that means that in every, um, every grant is, uh, in fact, they're uh, uh, given on a supplementary basis, and we try to see where we can help. And there are two key ways with which we have actually worked together with organizations who are trying to help through their work in specific countries, in specific programs in Africa. One is that of humanitarian aid, so where we actually give, in fact, an extraordinary grant, as has been the case often in the um, cases of uh, natural disasters, uh, of uh, famine, and um, this is uh, where we actually uh, um, are able to have faster reflexes, and that's where we need them also. But even though this is very important for humanitarian uses, we don't want to dwell on this. As an organization, we want to contribute to efforts that actually allow us uh, to be forward-looking and to uh, bring about growth, growth and development for those people who, as Lotus says, want to remain, as we said, in the country. So those will be able to create in their own homeland without needing to leave. And this is done through grants that have an educational character to a great extent. So the Saudi Arabia Foundation has, uh, in fact, um, supported organizations that might build schools with Action Aid, we've worked together in many such programs. Or we might actually have uh, literacy programs, um, access to books, access to uh, digital books, programs that more recently uh, support uh, sound journalism in uh, Africa. This is uh, actually together with uh, the Bloomberg Foundation, because we believe that uh, the citizens who are, in fact, aware of what's happening around them. We have better government, greater transparency, and we have a great multiplier effect here. And in health also, we have tried to create, together with other collaborators and associates, we cannot do it alone, especially if we are, in fact, a, a non-for-profit organization. We are not a state. But in health, together with other organizations, we've tried to uh, support programs that's not simply a medical or medical educational program, but we want to actually see how we can create centers of excellence of a medical nature, that is, hospitals that are, in fact, reference centers for the broader area. An example would be the hospital that is being built now in Uganda. And uh, this is being, um, in fact, designed by Renzo Piano's uh, office and uh, or bureau, bureau. And this is, in fact, for uh, surgery especially. And there is another program that we supported in Ghana for many years for orthopedic surgery. And this has, in fact, uh, resulted in the creation of a hospital for uh, such uh, top-notch uh, surgeries and uh, we also have Greek surgeons participating with the support of uh, the foundation. So being fully aware how small a drop we are in an ocean and uh, with great humility and respect with respect to this pluralism and diversity, we want to contribute and we want to be forward looking in these contributions. A lot of our colleagues have uh, visited many uh, countries of Africa, and on their behalf, I would like to say, as we said yesterday, Panos, that in their um, visits uh, together with um, uh, the organizations that we work with, most recently in northern Ghana, are amongst, in fact, the most memorable events that they have ever experienced. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. 
So let me say that it would be nice uh, if the Greek state followed uh, in the footsteps uh, of uh, SNF uh, and uh, Action Aid. Everybody has uh, its role to play, his or her role, but you see that the Greek state doesn't uh, give out any humanitarian aid. It's zero. But we need to listen. Uh, please listen to me. We cannot recognize uh, the rightful role that everyone has, and then we will forget uh, the um, share of uh, responsibility that everybody has. So let me clarify for many reasons in order to avoid any misunderstandings as to who is responsible, who has a specific role, uh, who plays a complementary role, and who plays the main role, the leading role. So uh, the Greek state gives zero humanitarian aid to African countries. It's down to zero. And this has been the case for some years now. And uh, this is unacceptable, uh, despite the crisis, uh, because since we're talking about Rwanda, and because we once said that there was a humanitarian crisis, Greece has a per capita income that is 25-fold that of the income in Rwanda, which, by the way, is not one of the poorest countries in Africa. I want to see if the audience would like to ask a question. Is there anybody out there who'd like to ask a question? and Consul of Zambia. Um, I think we must become a meaningful specific. When I first came here, we saw a video of the children that were born here and the problems that they have been facing here. At some point, I think we diverted to Africa. Um, I think we are here to talk about the children that were born here and have got problems, immigration problems. They don't have papers. We're not talking about the immigrants coming today. Um, we are trying to sort out the problem for the children that are already here. And I don't think we've actually said anything about the problem that we came here to try and solve. We've been talking about other things. So I'm not, I'm not sure, are we talking about Africa and the problems that Africa has today, or are we talking about our African children here in Greece? Just excuse me, but the topic of the, of the dialogue is not only the African community here in Athens, but uh, the conditions that everyone could face up uh, in Africa. So we, we, we tried to balance between the problems here, between the situation here, and of course, uh, of what happened happens okay. in Africa. Seeing what trying to balance, um, I think there have been some answers about how Africa is going to be solved or saved, um, but we haven't had any answers about how we're going to save the African children here still. Thank you. Oh, thank you. But I thought that the Kyrgios Odupitan, I like I think that Mr. Odupitan and those who spoke, the speakers, actually mentioned the problems facing uh, the uh, children here uh, born in uh, Greece of African parents or of African descent. Uh, just a minute, microphone, please. Please be brief. Uh, I also want to add uh, to uh, what was mentioned. I've asked uh, uh, a question through the platform. I feel bad that my country didn't live up to the expectations uh, of all the people who came from Africa, maybe because in Africa they didn't have uh, the opportunities they deserved. Uh, we didn't receive your question. Well, I'm going to actually mention it then. I hope uh, that the conditions in Africa uh, were OK, but I I hope that the conditions uh, facing people uh, who came from Africa were better than they are now so that they could fulfill their dreams. But let's not forget that problems arise because some people don't make the right choice or because they don't manage things properly. For example, ActionAid talked about Senegal and somebody who is a fisherman and who goes out fishing and finds no fish and ends up uh, immigrating uh, to um, uh, Europe. And of course, uh, if uh, the uh, politicians in Senegal uh, conclude agreements uh, with the multinationals who then uh, sweep the oceans clean. That's a different thing altogether. In Af South Africa, they used to uh, export uh, raw materials. There was an abundance of raw materials, but then they realized it's not enough to export them. We need to get the added value. We have to process the raw materials here, make products ourselves in order to be able to uh, make a, a profit. Uh, so the question is, why do the um, 
African governments not behave properly? Why don't they properly negotiate and why do they actually give everything to uh, foreign companies coming from foreign countries? Now, as to why this is happening, this is pretty obvious. There's corruption. Corruption is rife. And uh, corruption also starts from the person uh, who comes uh, to uh, corrupt others as well. So could you give the microphone to the lady next to you? The well, I can say that um, I've been sitting here for two hours. And from the beginning, um, certain issues have been uh, actually broached, things that concern our community. But I haven't actually heard an answer. Secondly, I want to put this question. If we can't, in fact, uh, be uh, able to be on good conditions with the Africans here, how will we do it with the other Africans who are back there? That's a simple question. Can somebody answer it? Well, I would be very pleased. Yes, but I'd like to say that in all these uh, matters put, especially uh, with respect to what you talked about before, the choices about what people want to become, professionally yeah, speaking, or uh, the conditions that exist, or the f uh, present forms of racism, or not racism as we knew it, or what Ms. McCauley said with respect to uh, the invisible shackles versus the visible shackles uh, in the past. We won't actually yeah, have any of our uh, speakers here tonight uh, give, in fact, uh, an answer, but I think that uh, it is a matter of uh, a dialogue here, and I th would have liked to have seen more hands raised so that people can be engaged in this dialogue. But I think it is neither Mr. Juliaris as a professor or uh, uh, the uh, gentleman from um, Ast Action Aid, Mr. Kuvaras, uh, or Mr. Karamagiolis as a director, as a producer and writer, can give an answer as to why we have these conditions here in Greek society. I would like to clarify this, and the purpose of this uh, discussion is to launch such a dialogue, unless there is no need for it. If we often have such dialogues, I think that we would actually be, yeah, in fact, on a better course. So in order to uh, actually yeah, clarify why we chose to come here and to launch this dialogue and to invite not only yeah, the speakers but all of you in this uh, event, which is public, which is open. And this was, in fact, an open invitation. And it is free of charge. Nobody actually yeah, controls who is going to enter and who's going to remain. But this is an open call to all. And that was in order to elicit more questions and for us to actually wonder upon leaving why. After so many years in a country with the, um, you know, the reality on the ground here in Athens and Greece, we are still here and we're discussing points which are self-evident. But we see that not even this dialogue has taken place in the past. So that is, in fact, the purpose of our discussion. If we had representatives here in the state, I would be, in fact, the first to ask questions of them together with you. But let us, in fact, uh, give answers as a society, as citizens, as how we actually uh, um, actually um, treat our fellow uh, citizens so that we can all stand united and ask for a better tomorrow for all of us. And we must be, in fact, acting in unison as a single voice. So I said the reason that we're here to discuss and the way that we've actually uh, gone about selecting uh, uh, the people to be here uh, in the discussion are not, uh, in fact, those who will give the response but, or the answer, but they are the, a the people who are able to talk frankly about this and not in, in fact, uh, beautified terms. So that's why we're all here today. So I'd like to actually respond on this. I'm not trying to give an answer, per se, but I think that something wasn't heard. And I think that actually yeah, relates to what you said. It has to do with the yeah, commenting on a broader strategy, as Mr. Mussoudi said before, of our educational system and how well this adapted or not to the change in the yeah, makeup of Greek society. And I think it's paradoxical to be a country that has 15% uh, people of Albanian origin, and we cannot actually give them the uh, 
option of uh, learning Albanian at school. And I think that a lot of things that we are experiencing and seeing here in this generation of uh, uh, African kids, or rather the Greek African kids, has to do with the uh, system and how it's um, in fact structured. So I don't think that things are so bleak. Things have in fact uh, advanced. We've made a headway. We're better off than we were five, ten or fifteen years ago. And of course, we're better off than we were in other countries, especially European ones. And also, I'd like to say that each and every one of us, as Dostoevsky uh, would say, are responsible for uh, everything uh, before everybody else. So I'm responsible for certain things. And I'd like to say that there's also responsibility on behalf of the migrants. For many years, I see that there has been a fragmentation. We're a country that whereby the uh, unions uh, involved in migration-related matters don't have, uh, in fact, um, the uh, superior level of organization. So they don't have uh, the uh, secondary uh, associations, which can, in fact, uh, engage in a dialogue with the uh, government. So it's not so important to say that I'm Nigerian, Congolese, or um, Syrian. But I think it's very important or Afghani, for that matter. It's very important to actually look at the common problems because migrants have many common problems. It's what Loretta said, what you mentioned. These are common problems. And I think they pe people have to stand united. So what the gentleman says is true. Yeah. So it's what the gentleman said. Every time we encounter obstacles, as I said, there are people who have been struggling in Greece all their lives to get a residence permit. And when can they get organized? Because all they deal with is how to get a residence permit. And they fail dismally, even though they try so hard. So this is what makes me wonder, how can they think of doing other things? Whereas nobody seems to be in power here and nobody seems to be able to find a solution and to help uh, towards a solution. I think that many things have come to let me let me just mention some things. We first of all heard that there is a Greek uh, university department uh, with African studies. Who'd like to go and study there? We heard what Action Aid does, and uh, it does a lot. Uh, Loretta talked about various problems and uh, how African uh, women uh, can uh, work together. And uh, sometimes I think it's good for the communities to get to know one each other each one another better and we also had a group from Greece now a group from Greece that is trying to uh, become a businessman and this has to do with the people of this generation so Michalis among other things yes uh, so among other things uh, in the film uh, you see that there are people not just africans who want to learn greek and they offer uh, greek lessons for free in order for these people to learn greek uh, become proficient in greek and become active members of greek society and uh, this discussion is now being held in Kipseli. And this gives us the opportunity uh, to talk to you and for you to come out and talk about your plans. And I think some answers have already been provided, and many are very interesting. And uh, I think there were numerous answers provided. Mr. Julianas, I think that this uh, dialogue, this event, offered the solution. It gave the answer. Mr. Julianas, you said that there are no uh, organizations uh, of second degree level that, uh, or tertiary level that can converse with the government. So as I said, uh, were we only talking about immigrants? No, but there are other groups as well. But uh, what you said is very vague, very general. I don't think that all organizations uh, can converse with the state, but there are organizations that do hold conversations with the state. Uh, but now we're saying that the state is turning a deaf ear. 
I don't know if you understand what our role is and exactly what we do, because as I said, uh, we uh, are advocates. Uh, we have the role of advocacy. But just like a strike, a strike cannot be successful if it's only in one factory. It's very important to have uh, a lot of uh, second level organizations because these are more influential. Second level organizations uh, have uh, organizations as members, not uh, individuals. And Greece uh, has a problem here when it comes to that, whereas in other European countries, they're very strong second level or organizations or bodies or agencies. So we, uh, how can we have second level uh, agencies when the state hasn't uh, helped these people become a member of society so that they can have such a loud voice and such influence? You're quite right in what you're saying. Two years have gone by since the uh, uh, Greek, uh, so since the crisis, the refugee crisis broke out, and uh, uh, two years went by without Greek lessons being offered to the immigrants. So there are always obstacles, always problems, and uh, the invisible shackles. So there are always problems, and this is why we're in the sorry state we're in now. I want to ask another question to the journalist, uh, to uh, Kintia, uh, who actually told me in a very nice way why we find ourselves here today. But how did I understand it? How did I see it? It's as if you're telling me that we came here today to dream in order to see how things could be and how life could be in order for us not to take action. So did you hear that many proposals or did you only hear about problems? I heard more things being mentioned about problems, more problems than proposals or suggestions uh, as to how to overcome the problems. So uh, well, we are all proposals, because what we are is uh, people that have initiatives behind them. So we're talking about uh, people who are active and who are trying to do things. Uh, and uh, you know what uh, the union of the Afghani woman does and what we do, Generation 2.0. We're not here to forward proposals. You actually came up with a proposal. You talked about your initiative. So we're here to talk about all these initiatives, uh, which many people may not know about. They may not know that these things are out there. And I think that by holding this discussion, many people can understand that it's not just the problems. Uh, we have the solutions. So we have the problems, and we have the solutions, too. And it's a good uh, idea to mention all these solutions. It's a good opportunity to present these solutions and uh, you need to find people who can support you and give you a helping hand and you can collaborate with one another. So good afternoon. I know that we're here because of uh, Africa, this wonderful continent, but I would like to actually um, go a bit further and I think that all of us here hope that we will soon see Greece that has an African teacher, a Chinese uh, police officer. And I think that is, uh, in fact, the collective strength of all of us who are here today. I think that the overwhelming majority who decided to come here and to be part of this uh, discussion want to see this next step for uh, Greece. I was able to work with Nikos uh, when uh, Generation 2.0 were started out. And I must say the strength of uh, the second generation migrants uh, or immigrant, rather, is uh, truly uh, awesome. And what is done now must open this up, and it should pertain not only to Africa, but all the uh, large communities that Greece has. Well, I think that this would uh, enable us all to leave uh, uh, with the greater uh, awareness. So it's an awareness-raising matter because it pertains to us all. So I would like to say that we politicized the discussion a lot, and we didn't talk about Africa as Africa as a continent. We didn't talk about uh, the uh, lovely things it has and about the wonderful people it has. And uh, I would like to learn a lot about uh, their culture, about their uh, customs and traditions. Where could I find them? What could I do in order to learn about them? Besides new generation, can I speak? Mm. So that is why we have uh, this organization of ours. 
We have uh, Generation 2.0. We have, in fact, uh, the uh, uh, organization of African women so that we can show our culture. And that's why we have the festivals. We have, in fact, festivals for solidarity and culture where we try to, in fact, uh, exchange views with uh, Greek society. We try, but we find many impediments in this route. Uh, so uh, we, um, in fact, do not desist. We continue. We persist. And I'd like to, in fact, uh, thank the Savarajin Arjus Foundation because uh, they uh, remembered Africa today. So I must say that they've done things for Africa, but uh, this uh, discussion here in Greece is a very good thing. If we were to do it more often, something would change. There'd be a shift in society, and uh, people would learn more about Africa. That's all. So can we have the mic here in the first row? Okay. And then the gentleman in the fourth row has been asking for the microphone for quite a while now. Rose John, I am an official in the South African Embassy. Uh, let me apologize. I haven't really had discussions because of language I was speaking here and there. But the only question that I would like to pose to the panelists is Has Greece ever seen any significant or a potential to Africans who are living here? Because what I'm listening, they are people who are on the receiving ends, who are helped with handouts, who are helped to do with skills, who are, but when they see them, do they see Africans who live here as people who can contribute and make a difference to development of the community? And also, I would like to go back to the, the children. You know, initially, I was like my colleague here because, as I said, I don't really understand. When children are born here, my assumption is some of them have been here they over 20 something years to still find that they cannot be integrated in the society and be part of the society after so many years i don't know i thought we live in a civilized world we are all members of the un and then you know racism and things are no longer but i am hearing that gradually it is trying to get there to try to make things to normalize situation really are there any opportunities do they equal opportunities for these children who do not know they cannot even go to africa because they will be aliens foreigners in africa because they do not know maybe their parents are still because i don't want to bring the issue of immigration or immigrants because it's a sensitive issue on its own and it has so many dynamics if we were to talk about it i'm just saying the children who are born here what opportunities do they have are they not integrated into as members of the society greek society because they will still remain africans forever and ever thank you thank you nick, nick i think you can answer that question you come into contact with uh, young uh, Afro-Greeks, uh, with young people of African descent living in Greece. As mentioned earlier, in the beginning of this uh, conversation, we as an organization, from the beginning, launched a campaign, a campaign to claim the right to citizenship, the right that should be granted to all uh, children uh, born and raised in Greece of African parents. We worked very hard uh, for this. Uh, we managed uh, to do so. The question is, how did we manage to do this? So we managed uh, to do this uh, by running a campaign for five years in order for us to have the first law in 2010 uh, that was adopted and uh, in order for others then uh, to be able to uh, send uh, this uh, law to the Council of State uh, 
the Council of State uh, did away with certain provisions in the law, and one of these provisions that was annulled said that uh, these children born and raised in Greece cannot be considered Greek uh, citizens just because they've been born on Greek soil. So this is uh, preposterous. Exactly. So just because they were born in Greece doesn't mean that they can be considered Greece, Greek. Uh, so this provision was uh, abolished, but together with this provision, the uh, right of the uh, immigrants to vote uh, in uh, local elections was also done away with. Uh, this was also cancelled. So we soon going to have elections, uh, municipal elections, and uh, these children will not have the right to vote. They won't be able to choose uh, the uh, local town councillors, municipal councillors and mayors, and also in the regional elections, the governors. Uh, so these provisions uh, were uh, taken out of the law. So we had to carry out another campaign. So in 2012, 2013, all the way to 2015, we campaigned, and uh, there was a new law that uh, came. And uh, we hope that this law has come to stay, because this law grants them the right to vote and the right to uh, and uh, also to claim uh, citizenship. You have to apply for citizenship, provided, of course, you've gone to Greek school and so on and so forth. This was the only thing that we managed. Now, forget about votes. We don't have the right to vote. So we're talking about this new law, which gives you the right to apply for Greek citizenship. So we, what we have now is the following. After 2015, there is a law, a law in Greece. This law was adopted in the Greek parliament, and it allows a, a child uh, that was uh, born in Greece uh, to claim Greek citizenship, to apply Greek citizenship, provided, of course, certain conditions are met. So the question is, uh, how long does this procedure take? So if we have a serious problem right now, this is the fact that some people have uh, claimed uh, citizenship, they've applied for citizenship, they did this three years ago, whereas according to the law, the procedure shouldn't take longer than one and a half years. So they should have received an answer, a yes or no answer, by one and a half years. And three years later, the administration says, look, it may take another two years. And I think that this is wrong because we have a law in place, but despite the fact that we have a law, we encounter many difficulties. Now, as to what is needed in order for somebody to become a Greek citizen and the citizen of the country one is born in and grows up in, well, I don't think that it's uh, it's not something that should be granted only to people who have great uh, talent in playing basketball, for example, like the Attentacunto brothers who became Greek citizens because they were great basketball players. So uh, do the people who have Greek citizenship not have the right to vote? They can. I'm talking about uh, the people who have been residing in Greece for a long period of time, long-time residents, people who've been living here for 20 years. They have a long-term uh, residence permit, uh, and they should have the right to vote. That's what I was referring to. We're talking about municipal elections, the right for them to vote in municipal elections. And to a candidates, the uh, candidates, uh, the immigrants who are candidates uh, for uh, the municipal elections and uh, the European Parliament elections, uh, they uh, always uh, actually uh, go to the Greeks uh, for their campaign. They don't go to the immigrants. They don't even have the right to vote. So what uh, can we do? This is the sorry state we're in. So what is certain is that, unfortunately, as you quite rightly said, there are always obstacles put in front of these people. Aten Dokumbo became an NBA a basketball player, and only then was he given Greek citizenship, and was he accepted by the Greek prime minister and given the icon of the Virgin Mary. I think this is the most characteristic example. You need to become an NBA basketball hero in order to get Greek citizenship. But there is progress. Progress, it's slow, but there is progress. 
and uh, thanks to wonderful organizations because Generation 2 is doing a wonderful job. It's one of the most dynamic organizations in Greece right now, promoting uh, the rights of the second generation of uh, people of African descent. So we're talking about uh, the uh, children born here. We're the ones uh, who do all the groundwork. Uh, we uh, are very uh, important. Uh, we have talked about uh, combating racism, no racism from the crib, but because we're women, they keep forgetting us. Uh, we are invisible because we're women. Loretta is the most dynamic African woman in Greece. She's very dynamic. We can't hear you, microphone, please. Last question for today. From 10 years old, I started. I yeah, actually yeah, participated in protest marches, and we were, uh, in fact, uh, engaged in um, fighting for uh, the second generation kids having citizenship. So we know that after uh, a lot of struggles in many uh, communities and organizations, to be able to um, actually yeah, make certain that we will have citizenship. So I am a living example. So I yeah, actually yeah, uh, waited four years after uh, submitting uh, my papers in order to receive citizenship. You know, you go there time and again, and uh, it took for ages. And uh, this is the greatest problem that we face above and beyond uh, the economic one, which is a common one. The immigrants um, actually yeah, have to tackle this uh, red tape, and it uh, ties them greatly. And this is a great problem over their heads. And if this problem did not exist, I don't think there would be yeah, any yeah, uh, criminality or kids uh, that are illiterate, uh, children that can't express themselves, because from the very uh, day of your birth, you know where you belong. If you don't know where you belong and um, when you're asked, you say, uh, I'm from Nigeria, but they say, well, you speak Greek perfectly, but, mm, well, basically I've been born here. So they say, you're Greek, and you see that the other people judge who you are. So we mustn't forget, and this is my view, so we mustn't forget that what happens uh, around us is what uh, also uh, plays an important role for the government. If I simply take myself out of the picture, I'm simply looking where to point the finger and finding an answer. It means that uh, others actually uh, define my life. If I don't want that uh, to be the case, I have to be engaged and know that I am, yeah, um, in fact, responsible. It's only when I'm part of the solution that uh, we will have, in fact, a better solution for the future. Uh, we have to uh, complete clued. So we only have one more minute because we have to see what ensues. So it's not simply a matter of the institutional framework. I had uh, a Nigerian student, Ibrahim, so uh, he was caught by uh, the police, even though he was uh, a scholar, he had a Greek scholarship, and uh, uh, two times the uh, police had withheld his residence permit, and I had to go twice to the uh, uh, police um, department in Acropoli, yeah, and uh, the uh, police officer uh, who had to uh, glue back the resident permits with uh, sellotape said, what can I do? This is, in fact, the people I have to uh, do my work with. And uh, I think that uh, it is, in fact, uh, up to all of us. It's up to us when we leave uh, uh, today from this uh, space what we do. Unfortunately, we don't have enough uh, time. We don't have any more time. And we said that uh, there are many facets uh, and Africa is huge. There are many people, many problems, but very many good things. It is not possible, and it would be naive uh, to think that we can actually broach all points or even give answers. It would be futile. I think that we have to first uh, put the question to ourselves. So we have Ms. Baskhali, who is uh, the artistic director of Slavonian uh, National She'll talk about what will uh, follow after this discussion. So it will be opposite from the point that we're now in. And uh, also an invitation. It's, in fact, uh, an open invitation for the end of June in the Summer Nostos Festival. Exactly that. 
Uh, we will close this very interesting dialogue uh, with a musical piece uh, from the Summer Nostos Festival. Uh, it's a small preview. Summer Nostos Festival for the second year is working with Uganda with uh, one, uh, the Niege Niege Festival, one of the most important music festivals uh, in Uganda. And this year we have uh, four uh, young producers uh, with uh, important participations in the biggest uh, festivals of electronic music in uh, Europe uh, and uh, elsewhere. We are trying to make their voice and the music heard all over Europe, the Nienge Nienge. So on uh, the uh, 23rd, 23rd, 25th, and 29th uh, of June, uh, there are going to be parties, uh, after midnight parties, uh, with uh, the rising DJ Slick Pack, uh, Kato Diosis, Authentically Plastic, uh, and MC Joe and Duke. So apart from that, on the 29th of June, we will have uh, the pleasure to have a young rapper, a woman from a rural area of South Africa, Soma Josie. We thought of showing you uh, some uh, snapshots uh, showing this great uh, uh, artist. So in a very short period of time, she's collaborated uh, with many important people and participates in many international festivals. All of that. So this will be at the Stavros Nyakos Cultural Center, 23rd to 30th of June, Summer Nostos Festival. It's by the Stavros Nyakos Foundation. So how can you get there? The admission is free. And uh, there are shuttle buses. Uh, you have free transportation from St. Dagma and the fixed metro station to the Faliron Delta and back. And uh, today we will finish uh, with uh, the South African DJ Menzi and then a live set uh, from ATH Kids, our own kids. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having this discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for being here, for allowing us uh, to uh, exchange ideas. I know that we sometimes disagree. This has given us food for thought, and let's hope that we will continue this discussion in the future as well. Thank you very much.